Let, let's start with um, the material today. Again, I'd really like to make an interactive. If you have questions, just raise your hand and uh, we'll answer them right away. I won't take a lot of questions and then answer them all back. We'll just go back and forth quickly. So the topic is, we talked about strategic thinking on Sunday, using that for strategic problem solving. But I think one of the things now we'd like to move into is strategic thinking in the area of scale up and sustaining. And maybe one thing that I can help bring to this group, we each have our own skills, but maybe one thing I can help bring to this group is we read the literature all the time. So what do we know from the evidence about what works in scaling up? So that's sort of what I'm trying to um, get across. So it's always good to... Um, Say, why do we care about a topic you're talking about? And I think um, the reason we care about scale up is very often we have got an individual case study of very high performance. We have a hospital that's doing really well. We have Gran Bassa that's doing unbelievably, or BOMI. Um, we have a particular doctor who thought up some interesting thing in a county somewhere. And we are pretty, we have some evidence. This is, seems like it's really working pretty well. But our question is, well, how do I replicate that? You're in the ministries and the huge health service. How do I actually make what worked so well in that one place and just make it happen through more districts, more counties, more people, and have a greater impact? And that's what I'm really defining as scale up, even though there are many, many terms for that. I mean widespread take up. So a lot of people are doing the thing that seems to be an effective innovation or an effective practice. So clear to everybody what I mean by scale up? Okay, so I wanted to tell a story, and I don't know how many people will know this story, um, but scale-up can be tremendously slow, and not just in low-income settings, and not just in healthcare, but in high-income settings, and in lots of different sectors. So it's a good story of um, scurvy, which the doctors in the room know what scurvy is, but it's yuck. You don't want scurvy, okay? So between the years 1400 and 1800, it really was the main threat to naval crews, with up to more than half the men on long voyages getting scurvy and suffering terribly from this disease. Um, in 1601, there was someone named Captain Lancaster who figured out that he would try to give three tablespoons of lemon juice, widely available, very cheap, three tablespoons of lemon juice to some men and not give it to other men. It's like the first controlled trial. And what happened? Scurvy ended up killing 40% of the men in the boats that never got any of the three tablespoons of lemon juice. And it killed zero people in the boats that actually got the lemon juice. So this was pretty good, even though it wasn't randomized, and even though it was pretty good thinking that, gee, maybe lemon juice could be helpful here. So that was 1601. Can you imagine it wasn't until 1747 until there was the first randomized control trial of this? So it was 150 years. And people were not routinely using lemon juice in that 150 years. It wasn't like, oh, well, everybody knows it, so we don't need to study it. Nobody was using it. People were dying of scurvy, completely unnecessarily. And then in 1470, uh, 1747, there was a randomized control trial in the British Navy that was wildly successful. And everyone said, you know, lemon juice is the way to go. It's cheap, it's easy, it doesn't even taste that bad. Everybody will take it. We'll just do it that way. It's still until 1805, the British Navy had, did nothing between 1747 and 1805 about this. So it was only in 1805 that the British Navy passed the proclamation to have fruits as part of the diet in Navy ships. So it's a 50-year lag. W what happened? And then that was only in the Navy. Of course, there's a huge board of trade, all of the merchants. And actually, that was not passed widely to actually order and really recommend in guidelines to have fruits or something like lemon juice um, on all board of trade boats, all merchants that were part of the board of trade. That was not done until 1865. So if you look at the first aha moment, in 1601, and then the final, what I would call scale up, where everybody was doing it, there's 265 years that passed. That is a long time. So we get frustrated ourselves with our little, gee, why can't people learn to this, that, and the other? But this is something that is human nature and has been in our history. 
So now what I want to move to is talk a little bit about, first I want to give you some definitions, and then I want to draw on the literature. Well, what do we know about moving from one idea to many, to a scale up? Um, so first, scale up to define, I'm using it to mean widespread use of existing practices, technology, and ideas. So it's not discovery, it's I've already had the discovery, now how do I move it out into general practice? And I also wanted <coughs> to talk about two other terms. Um, the diffusion of innovations is a very common uh, topic written about, and it really refers to the rate at which new ideas spread through cultures, geographies, or populations. Um, and some people will distinguish diffusion from dissemination. They'll say these are two different things. Diffusion more from biological cell biology, where you have, well, I don't know cell biology, so I, I'm getting on thin ground here. But what we mean by this is the passive spread from what's a high concentration to a low concentration. No one does anything. It just goes out through the membrane, and you have it, uh, the idea out to a, where it was previously low concentration. Dissemination is actually the active push. Somebody in the ministry, somebody in an academic environment, a practitioner says, we're going to sell this out. We're going to market it. We're going to push it out, not just simply passive diffusion. So those two words are described. And we're going to really talk a fair amount about dissemination. OK. So many of you, I think uh, Dr. Osrat maybe brought this up on Sunday. Many of you, or maybe it was Varpal, I can't remember. Somebody brought this up of the um, shift, the pattern of scale up that's seen. This, this pattern of change is actually documented from economists in looking at general textile industries and then moved into healthcare starting in like the mid 40s were the first studies that started to document this sort of approach to a population changing. And not just in healthcare, but in other areas. So it's almost like a biological rhythm. This is the way change happens. Um, and if you look at the beginning of change, are the innovators or the people who, you know, they innovated. They came up with a good idea. They tried it out. They saw it was successful. And then the early adopters, another 13.5% or so of groups. These are often the opinion leaders. The people are kind of tricky and risky, and they'll go out and try something. Then the early majority. Um, and finally, this late majority, which I think Varpala was saying, this is really where we ought to spend our time, is working on these late majority. And then laggards that actually are thought never to take, that's the word, never thought to take up a change. And if you put all your energy into getting the laggards to buy it, you spend a lot of time and they may never change anyhow. <laughs> right? So if you look at the yellow curve, that's kind of the important curve. Because the yellow curve is what percent scale up is there over time. Now on the yellow curve, the x-axis is time. And the important part of this curve is first the beginning part. An awful lot is happening in the beginning when you don't see it. And that, I, I think, Rwanda, your, your story was a little bit like this, because you sent us slides and said, so we did nothing. And I thought, well, you didn't do nothing. I mean, you have a more uh, qualified delegation for this problem now. Your minister agreed this was an important problem. You had external people coming in and saying, you know, you had some support. That's sort of the beginning. You know, the innovators have been found. So I think when we get discouraged a lot of times, we're in that little track where we feel like something's happening, but nobody's seen it. And then this large scale up, really that huge acceleration is the getting of this early and late majority. And then the tapering off just means basically some people will never take it up. And might as well stop spending your time on it, because they'll never take it up. So the big question, this S curve is what it's called. Um, and this S curve has been found, as I said, again and again and again. But for leaders of scale up, our real question is, can we change the shape of that curve? Like, what would the shape of that curve be if it was ideal? You were really successful in scale up. What would the shape of that curve be? Yeah. Straight. Straight and then and where? Like, way back there. Just it's time zero. Everybody's got it. Right? You hardly even have to say it like cell phones. They just whoosh, happened, at least here. I mean, you know, one day nobody had a BlackBerry, and then everybody had a BlackBerry. So, um, so you're kind of looking, how can I do that? And in a private market, it's easier, like Blackberries. Blackberries in the US, OK, they're affordable. They solve your problem. Everybody wants one. There's a market. There's someone who wants to push it out. They make a profit by pushing it out. You're happier because you get it. That's what capitalism is. But that's not what healthcare is. 
We don't have a capitalist market in healthcare in low income settings to be able to push anything out. We have to sort of figure out how do we push it out when there isn't a profit to be made. Or if the profit is a social profit, it's something that, well, people are living but that's different. That doesn't often motivate, sadly, doesn't actually motivate. So what do we use when we don't necessarily have a private market in which we'll actually automatically diffuse? It sort of tells us maybe in some of these healthcare and public health areas, we can't use just diffusion, i.e. it won't just naturally spread out because it's in everybody's best interest. Rather, we need dissemination tactics where there is some kind of strategic push to things because there's not an automatic, it's sort of like people always say, is this an idea that has legs? Have you ever heard of that? It means it'll walk on its own. And um, sometimes healthcare ideas aren't like that because of various, um, because of thousands of reasons and it not being a perfect market of any kind. So from the literature, the academics in the world who have thought about scale-up actually separate out the way scale-up happens in several different stages. And even without reading the words, when you see a whole page of stages to get from awareness of the thing to finally having impact, you figure it's going to take some time. And I think that's another thing that we often don't, or more people that we're all advocating with, maybe our ministers of finance, don't kind of recognize that actually scale up has to go through all this different stuff in order to finally have everyone doing it. So it beginning at awareness or discovery, the aha moment, the first time, you know, wow, I see three tablespoons of lemon juice matter. But then this huge agenda setting and priority setting. How do I get it on the agenda that we have to worry about maternal mortality? And what a huge story we had yesterday from Liberia about how they had worked this piece of the scale up, really, is get it on the president's agenda that it's the president of maternal you know, health, uh, women's issues. A third piece, and many of you have talked about this, after it's on the agenda and priority setting, often there is sort of the research, the debate, the evaluation, the decision making. Is this a good idea? Is it not a good idea? And, the Ethiopian team has talked about this a lot, so it's been on the agenda that we're going to do, that the country is going to do improvement of hospital functioning. And there's been a few aha moments with some really great successes, and maybe they're in the place here in some ways of research about decision making. Well, where is this really? How's it going to work? And who's going to do what? And is it really working or isn't it working? And I guess what makes this complicated is Dr. Gebraab might be on step three, and Dr. Tedros might be on step eight. I'm just using you as an example. But the point is, when you have got a whole team doing scale up, everybody could kind of feel in a different place. Like, it's already on my agenda. I'm already working on it. But it may not be on the agenda of someone else. So I guess some of the trick is, how do you get people in the same place um, on this kind of scale up? Uh, the fourth area is the adoption of the new idea. That adoption from an academic point of view actually doesn't mean you're changing anything. It means you decided, you committed to doing it. You made the commitment, yes, we're going to do it. That means you've adopted the idea. Um, and then usually before implementation, there's still another step of adaptation. So in Bomi County, they're going to do it one way. In Grambasa, they're going to do it another way. Lofa, they're going to pick another way. Some kind of adaptation of that. And Things can go wrong there, too, when you adapt, right? Hugely adaptation. The sixth step here, actually implementing. That's where, for, from the academic point of view, you're actually changing behavior. And implementation, and then you adapt, and then you implement more, and you adapt, and that keeps going, ultimately impact. So I'm curious, as you look at this list, whether you relate to it at all, and whether this actually seems like the path you're on or the path you've seen happen with the kind of interventions you've done, and where you think the biggest stopping point is, where the biggest difficulty is in driving a scale up. Anybody got any opinions on that? First of all, do you relate to the list or not really? You do relate to the list. OK. Well, that's good. Yeah, Dr. Gebraab. Uh, I've read a very good uh, new idea on, uh, on, uh, on scale-up. I've read something about scale-up, uh, the difference between uh, basing every scale-up based on practices, uh, good practices, and 
uh, going to scale up based on research as well as yes. is a significant difference. Yes. Because yes. scale ups is just copying, whether it's bad or not. Yeah. Yeah. What somebody has done there, you just copy. Yeah. You don't know the reason why. So yeah. it has problems of understanding. If you do the pari passu research that I am trying to say, then you learn more. Yeah. So that 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 is a difference uh, uh, I'm raising all the time with you, and uh, and in the in the platform. So the the uh, I'm not for uh, uh, against scale up at all. I believe in the scale up. And in fact, if I may tell you, just incidentally. My country believe it has a strategy which is called a scale up strategy. Yeah. Everything. Yeah, Everything yeah. what we do from the farmers, from the health workers, let's scale it up. This is a, a strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a national strategy. Mm -hmm. But if you do research together, side by side with that, then you know the reasons why you succeeded yep. or why you didn't yep. succeed. Yep. Yep. And then you understand. Yeah. So I'd like to address this, a really, really important point. So one could do scale up because, oh, sorry. You know how we are in the US. We just, what? I think you just had to say the question also. Yeah, yeah. OK. So you know, uh, was it KP? Oh, yeah, Ariel. OK, go ahead. I uh, know. Hit it one more time. Oh, yep, good. Oh, it's, the red's got to be on. Yep. OK, don't touch anything. No? OK, yeah, you got it. OK. Uh, you were asking about uh, which is the key moment. I think there are different key moments in trying to scale up a strategy, well, a, a model. Uh, I, I would say that the first one is getting the political will. So that the understanding that this model that we are trying to scale up is uh, contributing. So we need some evidence yeah. uh, that the model is, is better than what Two and have. three, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, also the, the, the importance of the issue because trying to, to install uh, an issue into the political agenda it depends on many factors. It depends on who is in the government, uh, what are their interests, yeah. what is the importance or what is the surrounding noise that is happening around the issue. So that's a key moment. But also a second key moment is once we have the political will, uh, we need, I guess, to for the adoption of the new idea to instrumentalize what we have done that is successful. Mm -hmm. So because when you go to other officer, or if it is a decentralized level, when you go to another regional authority, they ask you, how do I do this? And how much does this cost? And we're going to get the funds for that. No? So uh, we, you need to, to have a good answer for, for these three questions. Yep. Okay, so the first question is you need to instrumentalize the strategies that were successful. The second thing is you need to know how much that this cost. Yep. Because sometimes we have what I call uh, the Cinderella phenomenon. I think you, know, you all know about the story of Cinderella. Mm -hmm. no? uh, she yeah. had this big party, but then it sounded the 12 bells of the midnight, and then she had a pumpkin on her hands. <laughs> sometimes pilots, sometimes pilot mothers are like that. There was an we, exit we, strategy we, by somebody there. Yeah. We, place, <laughs> we place a lot, a lot of funds and assistance and visits and supervision when we are making the pilot. But then we ask public officers to make the same thing with less resources. Yeah. That's why I call the Cinderella, no? Yeah. So we, they, we say to them, now it's your turn, do it the same. But it's not the same because it's not as if we have been working this from the beginning with the public officers. So also in terms of instrumentalization, this is very important from my point of view. Yep. Great comments. Yep. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very nice model. Um, I see that uh, sometimes we have the bottleneck between the adoption and adaptation. Mm -hmm. The research results have come out that's been disseminated, all right. Then it stands there. How does it turn into policy for which people then start implementing? Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of um, researches that have been done at the universities. Actually, they are solution to most of our problems. And yet, they are on the shelves. H how to translate that 
we, we need an implementation team, a phase after the dissemination, some team that will carry the agenda forward. Yep. And that is where I see the leadership aspect comes in. Yep. The ability to push the idea through and make sure that it's not taking wholesale but adapted for implementation. Yep. Yep. I think it's a key place uh, we need to look at. It's absolutely like a handoff time. You know, you've got the policy and then there are different people who are going to then implement it. So that handoff and how you make a team over the handoff is very tricky. And we always refer to that as slippage from sort of what you had in the policy to really what you end up getting big. And I don't think there's any uh, clear answer on that, but I think what you said is very right on target of that's what leadership is. You know, how do you make the full link? I just want to make a comment about this issue where you get the research evidence um, that Dr. Geber brought up and you brought up, Ariel, a little bit. Um, you know, I think there are two th schools of thought on this, one being really from the biomedical research. And it may not be biomedical. It might be health economics. It may be more social science oriented. But there's a research study that's done. And it's sort of brought, it's more of a top-down approach. Let's design a study. We'll do something here, and we won't do it there. And then we will see which got better. Um, and that often gets published, and that's often become sort of the research base from which one might do it. I think there is also the sort of bottom-up inductive approach known as positive deviance, where you have got a, um, a group, uh, could be a community, could be a single facility, that's getting fabulous performance from a research standpoint. You look at really both qualitative and quantitative outcomes, and you say, no, this is an incredible case, and study that inside out so you can get to what are the determinants of that. And then that may be more replicatable. It's sort of, um, I think that's a, a very, it can be a very compelling way. Probably we need both. I mean, in the best place, you need both because it gives you the most confidence. You have a single case and you have a larger study that's giving you the research, the broad-based research. Thank you very much. Drawing back on the, uh, um, these phases of skill up, linking that with the past, with the, the, uh, the pattern of skill up, and even with the, the S curve of skill up. I'm wondering, in, 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 in linking that with these phases of skill up, when it comes to awareness and discovery, I want to where should we focus practically and in terms of the target for the, aware, for the awareness and then even agenda setting and priority setting? Which category of, of, of uh, uh, individuals should we target? Mm -hmm. The innovators mm -hmm. or, the, um, or the early adopters? early majority, mm -hmm. where should be our focus practically yeah. in trying to, to ensure that the, yeah. the awareness is created and the agenda is set? Yeah. There, I could tell you from a research point of view what people have found is the focus, this is post-innovation, so the focus here should be on the opinion leaders who are maybe not necessarily aware of it, but they bring a lot of people with them, and those are usually the early adopters. They're 13 percent of a population, they're not a big group, but they bring with them like a leverage point, um, uh, the early adopters and the late adopters, the late early majority and late majority. So those early adopters are sort of the key people that have to be in one and two, and they should be opinion leaders. So they're in the formal and informal setting. So a follow up. Yeah. But if you look at a pyramid society, yeah. I, I think you, you want to have a lot of opinion leaders at the top. Yeah. But I think in, in practical sense, within the opinion leaders, there, there may be people who are like us, I mean, within that group. Could be. So uh, I, and they could be very much, um, they, they could resist the skill of process. Yeah, that's the problem. If you have your opinion leaders, formal and informal. Yeah. So they could be formal and they're at the top of the pyramid, but they could be very informal too and be the bottom. I mean, they may not have a lot of status depending, I guess, what country you're in it, but they carry other people with them. If they happen to be laggards also, that they don't like the idea, they're against it, I mean, I don't know. I'd go find another thing to scale up. <laughs> I, I, 
I would just say, use your energies where you have potential. I, honestly, <laughs> Angela. There's also a time for mm -hmm. scaling up. Mm -hmm. um, and when it's not yet time, mm -hmm. you, you can just hit your head. That's a good point. Against the stone. Be That's patient. When you, you find all your opinion leaders are not minding you. There's not the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, Richmond. I just wanted to mention that sometimes, too, you would have expressed and even written down um, indication that people are interested to help s scale it up, yeah. even among the opinion leaders. Yeah. And yet, what is needed to deliver it is not forthcoming. Yeah. And so every time you, you talk about it, it's something that we all agree on, we want to work on. But what is needed to move from point A to point B yeah. just doesn't come. This sort of ties to what Ariel, I think, was raising, is that when you say, here's my idea, you need both sides of that. You need, and here are the benefits. And by the way, this is the kind of commitment we're talking about. It's this amount of money. It's this amount of new job descriptions, new laws passed, et cetera, follow up. I think that's absolutely right. You know, everybody wants to monitor the system and do evaluation of the system. But when you say, well, no, data costs lots of money to do. I mean, I was asking Amy this the other day. Okay, you want everybody to be in these GHI plus countries to be evaluating how they're doing, but w did you pay for statisticians? Did you pay for data analysts? Did you pay for data collectors? So I think giving both sides of the equation is critical, and usually I think it's hard to do because we want people to agree <laughs> that we'll do this. It's frustrating. Yes, Dr. Osrat. I just do want to remark on uh, uh, scaling up. Uh, I think the most important thing is what to scale up. Mm. We say we scale up uh, successful practices or best practices. And we have to agree on what's the best practice because everybody would say his is a best practice or his mm -hmm. is a be mm -hmm. best idea. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there is now an initiative to standardize best practice, to register them, to accredit them, so that resources can be invested in a successful practice, which is really successful practice. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, everybody would say his innovation is best, his, his practice is best, this has to be scaled up, and so on and so on. So some, uh, some, some countries even have uh, best practice centers. Yeah. And they register it, they accredit it, and then uh, it's appropriate to, to invest uh, uh, on those practices that are really successful and that are really best based on certain uh, standards. This is one, one idea. Yep. The other thing is, wh where do we really start scaling up? Do we, do we start at the, at the stage of ideas, or do we scale up practices? In my opinion, and the way we do business back home, yeah. we scale up doable, workable uh, practices, which have demonstrated, which, are, which have been established as producing really good results. So do we, do we start scaling up at the stage of ideas? Because we don't know whether, whether these ideas could be really, you know, uh, transformed into uh, <coughs> some practice. Or do we really, do we need to invest uh, at the stage of, I mean, or do we need to scale up practices that have demonstrated mm -hmm. and established mm -hmm. themselves to be, you know, mm -hmm. to, to have good outcomes? So mm -hmm. I think we need to to be clear on that. Mm, that's interesting. You take an incremental approach where you have an idea, you try it out. If it looks OK, then you scale. Or do you just have the good idea and go big right away? Yeah, you know, most people in um, the research would say that incremental approach is more successful. But there's a lot of reality out there that tells you something different. We didn't have a little internet. We had the internet. <laughs> so you know, I don't know. But you know, I think most political analysts would normally say the slow, you go from the practice, you pilot and go forward. But there was a comment uh, right there, I think, Johnny, yeah. Yeah, thanks. I, I think sometimes also the, one of the stumbling blocks is the quality of the information that is being provided mm -hmm. and how it relates to mm -hmm. existing information. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think as a follow up to what uh, the last speaker said, we have a plethora of, of interventions available. Yeah. If you take uh, interventions to reduce uh, child mortality, for instance, we have bed nets in place, we have immunizations, we have so many things. So if you come up with a new intervention 
which uh, you claim or by the evidence that you provide reduces mortality by say 20%. It sounds great, but how does it compare with existing interventions mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. place? Because more often than not, there is no new money. So the second point becomes very important. Uh, the health service need to reprioritize based on the quality of evidence available. Mm -hmm. Should I shift my money from bed nets to this new intervention or what? Yeah. And uh, most of our research that is generated does not do right. a comparative analysis on what extra benefit right. uh, that is being provided. So it becomes the agenda setting and priority setting a little difficult and yeah. uh, ultimately it affects scaling up of such new interventions. So we have to train health economists who can do cost effectiveness analysis. Yeah. 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 Uh, you just spoke, Tom, you were going to. I'm stuck on the first line. Uh -oh. Can't get off it. Uh oh. Yeah. And I think of the corporate world that is involved in, and with greater and greater success, is involved in more and more research and development. And I look at the issues in healthcare, how to take care of the elderly with a declining base of workers, with an increasing number of people over the age of 85, uh, 65 and 70. Or I look at the issues of healthcare in Africa, the issues of healthcare in China, where there are going to be 800 million people without sufficient care right now. They'll improve it, but that means there'll still be 500 million people comparative to the 50 million in the United States that still don't have healthcare. I wonder if every single program shouldn't build in everyone from your Ministry of Health to your district people to your supervisors, every single program, 1% of its endeavors in focusing on discovery of new ideas, experimenting, and, pil and piloting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Good. Thank you for the comment. Uh, yeah. One question for you, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, the adoption of the new idea. Assume that this new idea is inspirational, an inspirational yeah. idea. And of course, this idea has not just flickered from the mind, but has been a reflection of the outside world. I mean, yeah. some practice has yeah. uh, uh, brought it into your mind and you have reflected on it. So is not that the critical uh, stage in the phases of this scale up, the adoption of an, of an idea, both to understand it and believe in it. Yeah. Not yeah. only understand it, right. the knowledge. But commit to it. But co yes, yeah. commit to it, believe yeah. in it. And that is, that is why you need your evidences. Yeah. That is not why you need an organized body of thought. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I totally agree. This is an absolutely critical place, and it is often built by a body of thought and a body of evidence. And the only issue is things can still go wrong. <laughs> Because you could adopt, but that's the classic slippage to then actually implementing can go wrong. So I think it's, you know, each step has its challenges and each step has its sort of critical moments where things can fail. But it helps us understand why we don't scale up so easily all the time because actually it's a complex process. It's not a simple at all process and there are a lot of steps, including that one, where things can stop. Uh, let, oh, yeah, Jen. I'm actually stuck on the research. That's because you do research. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but I think in the United <coughs> States, at least, the research and evaluation part of this particular timeline is actually where things get stuck, particularly if there's a division of opinion or not really a lot of political will to see changes be made. It seems like, at least in the States, if you want to delay something, uh, the way to do that is to call for another commission or commission a study or have more research be done. I think that happens all over the world. <laughs> yeah, so it's, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, we sit in this balance, right, where we want more research, but we want it to be really fast and get the answer quickly. And, that, of course, that's not how research goes. So I think the, the weighing off of these different things is just an expression of your leadership. It's an expression of how you sort of feel and deal with what your practice is on each of these. 
I wanted to just take a moment to um, move us on to something. I'm, I'm not going to cover all these slides, but I'm happy to talk with anybody afterwards about any of the ideas. And I also would uh, recommend that you read one of the papers that's at the end in implementation science about the use of positive deviance, because I think it's a useful um, paper uh, in terms of scale up and using our practices to copy practices when that works and when it doesn't. But I wanted to um, put this model up, which is from that paper, uh, but also tries to integrate uh, some of the literature we have in trying to think of the myriad of factors we have to think about in planning a scale up, aside from those stages we went through. If we had to put create buckets of things we have to worry about to make scale up work well. Um, we think of them in these sort of four different domains. One of them is the features of the in innovation. What does the thing look like? Because some innovations are really easy to see their results. They're very observable. And others are not very observable. You know they're good, but it's really hard to measure it, like management. <laughs> I know it's good, but I can't measure its impact. Some innovations are really simple, you know, just take this pill. And some are really hard, you know, convince your family it should be okay for you to be home with the children when they're infants. So that, when we think about the, the types of innovations, there are going to be some innovations that diffuse or disseminate much faster because of their characteristics, and others that just don't. So that's one bucket of information. The, Second bucket of information is this bottom one, which is the features of the organizations or people or communities that have to adopt. Because haven't you all worked in some organizations where that county gets it immediately and that county just is asleep? Or, you know, this hospital's got it and that one doesn't. Or this person understands it and that one doesn't. So there's some features of the actual, the group that's got to adopt it that there may be certain places that are just warmer to innovation than others. There are people organizations and communities that are learning organizations. They think about, I want to do something new. And there are others that just don't want to. So that's an area. The third is the far left, which is really what does the environment look like? Is it in, has the environment been created in such a way that it fosters scale up? Are the laws passed the way they should be? Do you have the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Health? Um, do you have the right financing system? And that, you know, in your leadership roles, you're often in charge of that external environment, pieces of it, and you're in charge of the innovation, and you're in charge a little bit of the adopting organization. So how do you align these things? Of course, you're not really in charge. No one ever is. But it's probably within some of your jobs to really think about how do I create an external environment that will kind of suck this innovation forward because we've created the proclamation or we've gotten the president to say this is an important thing, et cetera. And then the last uh, feature of this is the dissemination strategy. What have you used for a dissemination strategy that will actually make this more likely uh, to work or not, to disseminate or not disseminate? And I think, um, let's see, I said I would go till 10.15. Can you, it's, it's 2 after 10. Can you handle till 10.15 or is that too late? You can handle it? Okay. Because I don't like to torture people past their <laughs> boundaries. Okay. <laughs> Not like David Berg, who kept you late yesterday. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, David and I laugh a lot about this because he's always, you know, boundaries, you're on time for meetings, and you've been, you know, and he was late yesterday. Okay. Um, anyhow, the, the features of the innovation from the research point of view have been found to be these features, and this has been again and again in many different instances. Is it simple or is it perceived to be simple? Can you wrap your intervention into there are four things you need to do? There are two things you need to do. Even if it isn't really simple, can you market it so it's simple? So that's one characteristic. Compatibility is, um, is it compatible with the way life is now or can you sell it that way? Even if it is really a shift, can you say, but this is consistent with something that is kind of makes people feel like, oh, yeah, this is compatible with my values. This is what I do. The ability to pilot, this is to your point, Dr. Asrat, I think you asked about is it better to um, uh, just diffuse an idea or have a bit of practice and diffuse the practice. You know, the literature would say it, it will diffuse faster if you can pilot it before any large-scale investment. 
fourth characteristics, can you see the results? And this is to Dr. Gebraab and Ariel saying, we need the evidence. So can you see results? Is it something that you can feel and see? Um, and the last one, of course, is the most important one, which is, is it perceived by your users to have a relative advantage compared with the status quo? Do, and Johnny, I think you brought this up. Is it really better than what we have right now? And if you have an idea in your brain that you think is a good idea, but it doesn't meet these features, then it's going to diffuse slower. It is absolutely going to go slower. So I think it's part of sort of being strategic and think, how do I make this intervention such that it is going to look like those? And what do we need to do to be sure that is the case? Does it make sense for people? Yeah. Um, let me just see. I think given the scope of time, this is just sort of the environmental pieces that are sort of consistent with our literature on what uh, drives diffusion. If your environment can look, if these things are consistent with the inno innovation, like the professional norms, they buy it. You've got regulatory requirements um, that are in sync with what you want to actually accomplish, and you have financial incentives. You know, this is yeah, 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 but of course the most complicated things to get. Um, I think in terms of the adopting organization, um, there are many, many studies about what kind of organizations learn better, what kind of organizations actually adopt new ideas faster. I tried to synthesize these into, uh, into something simple <laughs> that we could disseminate easily. So I'm using the same tactic of just trying to wrap things in buckets that we can remember and, and repeat. Um, but you've all heard this of the champion inside the organization. There's a large literature on learning organizations, and we tried to put some readings on that in the back of your book, um, one by Robert Garvin, who's really, our, I think, the leading expert, at least in the US, on identifying learning organizations. There's a nice little tool there that you can say, gee, is my organization a learning organization? And then are there organizational structures that support adoption? I don't know if people have found certain structures that really support adoption or not. Typically, these are there is some kind of committee structure or governing structure that is charged with looking at the environment to understand what is new out there and we might want to bring in. That's not necessarily the line operation or the actual uh, people who are on the units. Uh, I just wanted to, I think that this would probably be the, the best place to um, end this piece and to talk a little bit more about it, is the dissemination strategy. So let's say that you've got an innovation that is um, simple or you can sell it as simple, compatible, you can pilot it, uh, people believe it has a relative advantage. Um, and you have an external environment that's pretty warm to bringing this thing on and you have identified a set of communities that you think will adopt it. Still probably not enough. What is the dissemination strategy? What's the way, and you know, if we were in a pharmaceutical business, we would know our dissemination strategy. We would be, we'd get marketing, we'd be ready to go. But we're not in that. We're usually in some kind of medicine or public health. So what's our dissemination strategy? And I think that you have identified most of the things on the list, although I want to underscore a couple other ones. We identified in our discussion already, it's got to be based on recommendations of, that come from credible evidence. And I would say that given the discussion before, um, and I think Jen, you brought this up, is people, some people think this, some people think that. It's really got to be credible to the people who are going to adopt it. So it doesn't have to be credible to a huge academic somewhere. It has to be credible to the people who are, you're changing their minds. And sometimes, and we see this all the time in the US, even though we have the NIH and billions of dollars going to research, the single case study in front of Congress of the person who's you know, got renal failure, that changes whether we're going to pay for kidney transplant or not. Not the billions of randomized trials about whether kidney transplant is a better thing to do or not. So the credible evidence is for the people. That means the people who are going to make the decision to adopt. Um, the second part of a dissemination, so get the evidence you need to convince the people who are ultimately going to adopt. This is sort of assuming you have faith in it. 
The um, second is finding the opinion leaders, and we talked about this before. I think, Varpala, you had raised this. And be sure they adopt it first, because even though they're only maybe 10% of the population, if they adopt it, they bring 60% more, and before you know it, you have a majority. So getting to them first and kind of giving up if you can't get them. Or wait. <laughs> Angela, you said just be patient. Maybe it'll be a bit later. The third one I don't think <laughs> we actually talked about, and I, this is something that I am very uh, wed to, um, is to give practical tools. So people, we sit in our desks and we think great thoughts and we're writing all the time, and, and you're making policy all the time. But what are the practical tools that can be given to the actual units that are going to adopt? What are the blueprint type things or the very straightforward easy to sort of say, okay, this is what I do. And that practical tool part, I think, is a kind of a critical piece from to avoid the slippage from the big policy to the implementation. There just have to be tools. Um, and I think that's often something we don't do that well because we're not actually at the front line. We don't have those jobs. So how do we create practical tools? But I think that's the leadership. That's how do you in the leadership role find the people at the front line and engage them enough to create practical tools. And the last, um, the last part of the dissemination strategy would be to use professional and social networks to disseminate the information. You know, how do you get into the gossip chain? How do you get into the ones who know? Whether that happens to actually be, I don't really mean gossip, but what I mean by that, that was supposed to be a joke here, OK? <laughs> what I mean by that is how do you get into that, you know, oh, they said it, so I buy it. You know, how do you get into the network, if you will? Because that's really where change happens. We all do that. Even if we think we're very rational, we actually really do listen to those people who we just sort of think no. And so how do you use that instead of, um, try to be overly rational, I think it's a part of actually using your emotional intelligence, like Peter talked about, is how do you use that part, which is just networking, just networking to get the information across. Um, so these would be uh, my big thoughts about this. I'm going to skip this and just go to um, the summary, um, if that's OK. And um, my summary, and then I'd be happy to have us talk a little bit more, is um, a good, the point of scale up, I guess, is just a good idea is not enough to foster spread. Just, it could be a great idea. It does not have legs in healthcare. We don't have the kind of markets that bring a good idea automatically forward. Lots of things can stop it. And the second is scale up tactics should be considered as part of the actual intervention. It's not sort of like you've got an idea and then someone else will do that. Actually, the idea is both the idea, the innovation, and everything wrapped around it that will diffuse it. So that is, I think, part of the actual intervention. Um, and that's not unlike Peter Salovey either. See, he is brilliant because he said framing. You know, sure, you can have the technical idea, but you've got to frame the information a certain way for people to take it. Same idea. And then just last overall, scaling up and sustaining, which we didn't get to that, which frankly I'm just as glad given our conversation the other day. Um, scaling up and sustaining health initiatives requires joint commitments from scientists, from management, from regulators, policymakers, and I would absolutely say in this, really from the front line of the people who are going to be adopting and ultimately implementing your intervention. So I think it is 10, it's 10 after 10. If there are a few comments on this, piece of it. We probably have a few minutes for some short comments. Is there any thoughts, reactions? You just want to leave. <laughs> Was this helpful at all? Okay. Well, okay, good. Well, thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to talk about more of this later. <laughs>